round when everything is in equilibrium, uh, you actually could not tell time because there's kind of there's no change to some extent or no kind of change which you could reference the passage of time to. Yes. Paul, thank you so much for that uh, insight, perspective, and that guidance. Your presence, leadership, and energy is so amazing. Thank you. Alexander, back to you, sir. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, yes, Paul. Um, yeah. So, Paul, I guess I have a question regarding, um, I guess, the definition problem of, of time. Um, so you, you, you've referenced some baseline uh, clockwork, um, and then you and then you just defined the current time models as essentially being discretized. Um, so I guess the question I have for you is, if I was to ask you to formalize time at the most fundamental level, um, what do you think that would be if we were to go beyond the concept of energy, for example, um, as an abstraction or an analogy? Um, um, what are your thoughts on that? Mm, okay, so I think there you kind of uh, packed a lot of things into this question. That I remember kind of also our discussion from kind of the last time, where your your kind of uh, your questions were uh, like were pointed at kind of this uh, difference, or you called it duality or polarity uh, of kind of perceptions or models of of kind of time, and uh, yes, like maybe should first say like how kind of time enters physics uh, and it does so by basically being considered like a continuous real parameter so like some number like a real number uh, which can be kind of infinitesimally small uh, resolved uh, that basically runs from minus infinity to plus infinity in most physical models uh, could say okay it starts with the beginning there's like kind of a t equals zero which is the big bang if you kind of go to cosmology but mostly in physics you would just consider it as like kind of this kind of continuous parameter uh, that for if you kind of include relativity theory kind of can kind of change its behavior or kind of relative behavior to each other if you kind of consider every space time point or every object in space time to have its own proper time uh, but it does not change much about kind of the uh, the fact that that it's still a continuous parameter and so quantum mechanics actually arose or can be mathematically seen as a kind of uh, a quantization of this kind of uh, um, let's say continuous parameter that exists in in classical physics for example as momentum or space or energy um, and the funny thing is that actually like the only parameter that is that survives kind of this process uh, when you kind of derive quantum theory kind of unharmed this time so time also in quantum mechanics is still kind of a continuous parameter and this makes it kind of quite mysterious to some extent and uh, this also goes like so quantum theory is kind of the uh, most uh, effective and kind of uh, accurate theory we have derived so far. So, like all exper, like we have not kind of found any uh, experimental contradictions or kind of facts that we could not explain in the regime that we think that it's valid so far. Um, so uh, uh, it, everything seems to be work out fine. Still, I think it's kind of uh, and this is kind of this polarity thing or like kind of a maybe kind of a little uh, tension between uh, kind of what theory and kind of experiment says like for me this is like this kind of continuous parameter is kind of a convenient fiction as like all experiments we can do in the world are like always only give us discrete values like there's there's kind of as far as I know no way where how we can really kind oh, of oh, sorry for interrupting uh, you yes sorry. Thanks for saying. Thanks for saying that. And precisely, and I, I think that's that's where that's that's why it's hard for me to reconcile a lot of the sciences with with this with the formalization of time because I think it's impossible to 
to be able to, 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 to represent the completeness. And like you said earlier, and the consistency of, ta- of, of, of this fundamental time in any discrete format. So, so, so the question then, so shouldn't the question then be, what is the most fundamental representation in a discretized format? Wouldn't that be the question? Uh, that's a good question, but I, as far, like, there's also a kind of attempt to do this, but it's a very difficult problem because as I said before, like quantum theory as is, uh, kind of, uh, works pretty fine. So like, uh, if you kind of do the same thing with a discretized time, um, it can only make your heart life harder, uh, but still kind of, sorry, yeah, to just to come back to this point, it's like about kind of measurement or observing the world is that for me, like, like all measurements we do, all observations of the world we can do basically always give us discrete outputs. Uh, so we are not able to kind of resolve infin- like continuous uh, variables or like kind of, uh, we cannot perceive kind of, something that really amounts to uh, a kind of a real number in the sense that we have infinitely many digits after it because there's always kind of a, a bound on the resolution or a, uh, yes and also measurement error two things uh, i don't know if this uh, answers the question oh no oh, no that was <laughs> okay <laughs> jonathan you want to jump in that answered the question perfectly paul thank you i'm going to jump in after jonathan asked his question Oh man, thank you, Paul, for being here. This just is mind blowing to say the least. That's an understatement, by the way. Well, let me ask you a quick question, right? So, in the world or the universe that we live in, there is maybe two actors an observer and an agent. Would you agree with that statement? Maybe there's more, but I think there's an observer and an agent. Would you agree? Uh, I'd, I'd like it's a. Uh... That's a hard question because kind of it goes uh, exactly to the kind of the borders or kind of the edge of what we're able to say with quantum mechanics or within quantum mechanics. Uh, Like for me, these two kind of notions would be actually the same. Like somebody that observes or like an entity that observes something is actually an agent. Uh, Like maybe the people use this differently because an agent is kind of associated with kind of something like a, a choice uh, and an observer is kind of passive, but uh, I think I would interchangeably use these two notions. Got it. Thank you for that. Thank yeah. you for that confirmation. So maybe last question for me at this moment, which is that when you say continuous, do you think infinity is continuous? I'm just, I'm trying to discretize this at, and try to come to a definition. Would you say continuous is infinity? Um, no, but you need infinity to kind of uh, have something continuous and you actually need more than infinity because I don't know as to how far your knowledge goes about this, but there's kind of different kinds of infinities, no? Like there's, for example, the infinity of the natural numbers, uh, yep. which is basically like, which are countable. So I can kind of count until I reach infinity and can continue counting. Uh, yep. And then there's infinity that's a kind of... Uh, that are not countable, like for example, the uh, the amount of net counting could kind of have a discrete system. So, 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 so. but it also may turn out that kind of uh, maybe uh, like even thermodynamics kind of are are kind of a, like a really weird theory in the sense that the first like it holds since its inception, uh, and there's kind of two kind of kind of course kind of perspectives you can take on this like one is uh basically that it was formulated in such fuzzy terms that it it applies uh, nearly everywhere and the second one is like maybe there's kind of something that the kind of underlies thermodynamic laws which is has to do for example with just kind of a logic uh logical facts or computational facts that lead, lead to this behavior Nice, nicely said. So, okay, so you mentioned uh, um, computation and yeah. uh, logical. So the reason why I actually brought up um, 
brought up this fundamental formalization is because you talked about measurement time. You, you mentioned measurements quite a few times. And mm -hmm. when I hear the word measurement in my head, I'm thinking if you're going to measure something, then this thing already existed or precedes uh, its measurement. W would that be an accurate assumption? That's why I have, uh, I have a like the prop the property yes, but maybe it's it the value not as with like in quantum mechanics you can take the perspective that kind of uh, kind of the value of the measurement actually comes uh, like kind of uh, emerges with the act of measuring, um, but the properties yes like I think. Uh, but in the same way that uh, that, for example, so, pressure so, does, no. Like so you're saying that don't know the value is still is still gonna remain married. It's still gonna remain married to the to the or, to the uh, to the um, to the to, to this fundamental formalization, despite the fact that where it's being measured, the measurement is just a discretized representation of that. Is that what you're saying? So the system still remains married or entangled together. Yes. Probably yes, or it's still still subject to to kind of the uh, kind of the mechanisms or laws that uh, that govern this behavior. I don't know if this makes. Sense. I'm sorry, I missed that, Paul. I was getting a call, so ah. my phone got muted. Ah, uh, so like I think it's it's kind of it it will be still be subject to kind of these laws that that govern this behavior. So if you think of time as kind of a, a law or a mechanism that governs the behavior of systems, uh, in this sense, I think it will uh, kind of continue to hold true, uh, even if we discover more underlying uh, kind of mechanisms or laws or behavior of things. Thanks, Paul. So it seems, yes, it seems like the same way for like the second law of thermodynamics, no? Uh, mm -hmm. Even if we find out, uh, like it could also be reversed. I don't say that it's not possible to break the second law, but I think it's, uh, for all I can say, it's basically possible. Even Wait, so, Paul, Paul, it's, Paul the thing is, in yes. thermal, it's not about possibility, it's about efficiency, right? It's just not efficient to go backwards in time. Is, would, would that be correct? Um, the, the possi it, it, it's possible, it's yes. just not efficient, hmm. right? Our, our efficient. Yes, maybe you could put it in such a way. Yes, um, uh, I would not object. So, uh, so from an efficiency like perspective, the right? From the only thing that. So sorry, sorry, Paul. From efficiency perspective, can we then model that with com with, with, with complexity? If, if, if we're gonna, you, you, if we can accept that efficiency is a is, is a is a good framework, right? Then can we then use complexity to to model the same concept and then use efficiency of of the of 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 to 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 understand the dynamics of that so efficiency is like a very uh a very thermodynamic concept no like you basically measure the the ratio between in and output of energy or whatever you resource you use um so and or or you could take it in a computational sense but then it would just measure kind of the number of steps uh kind of how this problem scales and if it scales okay you would say it's efficiently computable um so uh, no that's the right direction i like that i like i like the computational complexity direction i think that's a i think that's a good that's a good so from that from that from that direction then can we can, can we then model the same concept out with uh or, or with, with um or, or with, with, with algorithms and then sort of figure out the the the, the optimal or the the, the 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 baseline efficiency the baseline uh algorithm that we could derive all the subsequent algorithms from that would be more would be discretized and 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 thus less efficient as, as opposed to the baseline Yes, but the problem is that, that, that like you like you ha in algorithmic kind of uh, computation, you have a measure of complexity, actually, you no, know, like the Kolmogorov complexity, which is which gives you the program, the shortest program that can basically like output uh, a certain bit string. That's the Kolmogorov complexity of an infinite bit string. But the problem is just it's provably uncomputable. So, like. Uh, it's a very nice measure. You can kind of do very nice stuff with it, but 
but you can effectively never really use it, no? It, it, exactly. It's, it's the it's the incomputability problem, right? It's the it's it it also goes down to in computation the um the the fact that our, the machines are finite state machines. So so and you know, but it's I, not but I, it's yes, not only a finite state. Like you have like uh, the Turing machine. Uh, yes, like it comes down maybe not finite state, but like to also to the problem that basically a Turing machine is uh kind of is subject to the halting problem which basically like is a reformulation of uh the incompleteness theorem yeah correct so so now that boundary that we're referring to this boundary that we that we we just hit with computation the same boundary that we hit in in in, in the thermodynamics uh framework that you that you talked about earlier uh, it, it, would you say that this boundary is the same boundary, sort of philosophically? Mm. I've, I've so, so let, 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 let me elaborate. Because, let me elaborate, because, Paul. Because, let me elaborate. So, mm -hmm. for example, we have we have uh, so algorithmic efficiency, you, as you mentioned earlier, we, we, computationally, we can model the efficiency with, by optimizing time and space the time and space complexity of the algorithm, right? Um, and I was saying that because we talked earlier about uh, sort of if we were going to uh, go backwards in time in the universe, that 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 it wasn't impossible. It was just not efficient. Yes, like in 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 a, it, it depends on on what kind of assumptions you make about the the world. No, like if you're if you think we live in a deterministic world, then actually this kind of backward forward doesn't make any sense at all it only makes sense if you assume that you like kind of the world kind of has uh, there was at least one random bit in the universe and uh, kind of that kind of there there are irreversible processes and you're right like irreversibility just kind of to some extent in most formulations is more a probabilistic statement than kind of a fundamental one uh, in this sense, you're right. I'm, I'm just very like I find it hard to kind of uh, combine the, these notions in this context. Uh, uh, yes, because I don't see that they kind of apply to the same objects, kind of in the sense in mathematical objects or objects that rep that yes that exist in some theory. No, that's that's a valid point. That's a valid point. And you know, I I, I said that because you know I was looking at um you know. You know, Turin and and Goodell, they talk about this the boundary that I'm referring to, and they approach this boundary from different perspectives, and 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 Turin, like you mentioned with the incompatibility and the Houghton problem, is that there's a wall there. There's a wall. There's a wall in computation. There's a wall in physics. There's a there's a wall that we keep we keep knocking, and it's difficult to unlock what's on the other side of this door and, and that's what my, that that's where it's it's very hard for me to reconcile these this that that there is there's not something beyond that right and and, and if there's something beyond that is it, it is it a matter of access or is it a, 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 like w what exactly is the issue that, I, that academia has to solve here so yes so but if, if, like of course, you could just kind of uh, speculate about kind of the existence of super Turing machines that basically can compute these things. Uh, that, but I don't like think that like we don't see any kind of indication that such things exist in nature, uh, or like that we kind of observe. But on the other hand, I, I don't know. I would not describe it as a wa wall. I would rather like both problems. Kind of, they they don't give you a wall. They just say like within kind of a system of a certain size, like a kind of a Turing machine of, of kind of a certain size or like a, a mathematical theory with a certain amount of uh, of axioms, you cannot express kind of uh, all the things you want to do or you cannot kind of compute the probability of a certain program to stop. But you, what you can always do is add one more. And that's this kind of wall thing that you describe uh, is for me is actually kind of something that we try like it's not so much a wall but like if you kind of follow down this this path of just kind of ex including one more axiom or kind of adding like making your computer machine a little bit bigger 
you kind of end up in an infinite regression. And that's something normally people want to avoid when they uh, do science because it, uh, yes, basically never stops. Uh, yes, so it's, and, yeah, yeah. So yeah, and, and and that that's I think that's where that's where my that's where my my, my problem lies is it's the it's the reduction the reduction requires like you said adding one more variable adding one more variable adding one more variable and in a way I feel as though that actually makes uh, the system less efficient. Um, so I don't know what do you, what do you, what what are your thoughts on that? If you add if you kind of <clears throat> expand it. The other, I'm sorry, like it's just hard for oh, me to let me, let, 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 think let me elaborate. Of, let me elaborate. Efficiency in this country, yeah. yes. So, 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 for example, um, let, uh, let's use data, for example. The more data mm -hmm. you have, the more efficient your predictions would be. Um, um, uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you, and if you, if you, have, if you make a prediction beyond the bounds of your data, then the predictions are going to be, um, um, uh, likely more likely to be useless because. Uh, you, you've gone beyond the bounds of the training data. So wh wh what I'm yes, saying is that- I would use in this sense, it would be accuracy, no? Like, because like, if you're still, if you have enough data, then it, you can be accurate and everything else that you probably would be become inaccurate. Uh, I, I, like the I don't understand. The efficiency in this yeah. sense would can, be- Can you repeat uh, that, Paul? No, Sorry, because, like, can you repeat that? I don't understand. Uh, so, so in this sense, what you like were describing to me, I would not call efficiency because efficiency would be for me, for example, how how fast can you go through the data? That would be efficiency. If you have a lot of data and you make a prediction about something that you can predict with the data, it would be an accurate or kind of uh, yes, like accuracy would be such a, a notion I would use in this sense or precision. And if you try to predict something that is not included, then it would become inaccurate. But if you have the same amount of data and you can kind of uh, chew through it or process it at the same kind of rate, it would like it's equally efficient. It's just that the result in one case is uh, more likely to be correct rather than the process being inefficient. Uh, it's interesting, interesting, um, I, and this this goes to the, the the problem in, in in deep learning and AI research, um, and mm -hmm. I was listening to um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, Francois Cholet or um, a couple other researchers that have started to uh, come to the uh, realization that you know uh, our current deep learning models are actually uh, not continuous um, that they uh, interpolate and uh, are incapable of actual extrapolation. And what this researcher, Francois Cholet, said was that, um, was that uh, this actually creates the, the same boundary that I, that I was referring to the, with Turin and Goodell and the likes of that, uh, the boundary that prevents um, the, the ability for, for the AI models to be able to generalize. And generalization in this regard, as, uh, as far as Francois Cholet, is the ability to essentially um, uh, um, solve uh, abstract problems or task specific problems uh, without the need of constant stability of the variables. As, as you said earlier, always adding a variable, reducing the variable and all of this. Uh, so, so, you know, and, and the thing is, I'm, I'm actually in line with that, uh, with that, with that perspective, because I, um, I think it's, to be able to extrapolate beyond beyond trained data, I think that's a very that's a key part to um, understanding the interactions of systems fundamentally. What are your thoughts on that, Paul? Uh, yes. Uh, so I don't know this this guy, but um, I think this goes a little bit like of like it just uh, would say that I can just opinionate on it uh, rather than kind of uh, give a, uh, like a, more like an educated guess rather than, um, but it, yeah, I think like for me, like, yes, like all these machine learning algorithms and stuff, they're very powerful and they can do a lot of good things, but uh, they're, they're also like, they, they, they inherit the biases that we kind of, uh, kind of have in the data, no? Like, uh, um, 
I don't know if it's uh, if it's such a philosophical question, uh, or if I I never really thought so much about it in a philosophical way, rather in a kind of technical or limitations way. Uh, yes, so I probably all know the story about uh, kind of the biggest kind of the first machine learning algorithms that basically as a data set used the uh, Enron scandal emails so uh, most kind of text recognition programs and stuff like this uh, are initially trained on like the conversation of uh, white rich male corrupt beings uh, but uh, on the philosophical oh, oh, you know what's Paul? Yes. sorry for yes. interrupting you Paul but yes. what's interesting yes. is that I don't think we even have to get to the point of the, of the individuals that are dealing with the data. I think the data itself is inherently incomplete. If, if, if we can agree on the, on the if, we, if we can invoke Goodell, invoke Turin, invoke um, Markov, I mean, we can, we, can, we can say that data is inherently not a complete representation of what we're attempting to model, right? So, so most definitely, yes. So, 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 so doesn't that then sort of still allude to the exact same wall that 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 um that 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 you that you're alluding to when you talked about the time and and the inability to essentially get a hold of that reference point that axiomatic time to essentially be the north star for all the other discretized representations of time maybe uh, <laughs> I, um, I cannot definitely answer this question uh, but uh, but yes like uh, I think there's true like we all we always have to like deal with incomplete data and kind of as scientists we kind of try to make the most out of it um, and uh, that's why probably also AI will have its problem replacing us because like sometimes you kind of have to look over over like your own horizon to actually make sense of stuff um and yes i don't know like philosophically uh, i'm i don't know how to, how to formulate this but uh but maybe you should go to kind of something i don't know if you know the holographic principle which would basically kind of to some extent contradict this or it's not something proven it's something people assume uh i think mostly in string theory uh but it's kind of that basically all information about uh, a system is contained contained in its surface. Uh, I think it's more like a neat mathematical trick people use, uh, and it did not lead to string theory to anything so far. So uh, yes, I'm I'm happy to deal with the incomplete and the partial data I have about the world to try to make the most out of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh understood understood yeah I, I was just asking because uh if uh if, if you if it's if it's time to create a self self-contained uh model for clock like you said um mm -hmm. i think that's gonna be a that's a crucial part right it's you that's you ha you cannot do that with discretized models no but so our basically our our model is discretized it's the only way like kind of we kind of escape completely kind of like or staying operational in the sense that we can kind of uh, uh, also measure the behavior of our clocks is to assume this kind of continuous background time if, if this makes sense but otherwise our model is uh, completely kind of discrete in the sense that all energy states are kind of discrete energy states and kind of the the ticks kind of the signal you get from this clock comes in uh, discrete packages um but yes there's definitely kind of a tension with uh with that how people look at, at time measurement Paul, that makes sense. You yes uh in your statement that you just said what is background time can you define that for us please uh, ah uh, so this is basically like uh it's kind of local back i would say like even schrodinger time or local background time is basically kind of this the parameter uh and under which kind of quantum systems evolve so 
like given kind of the behavior of a system, which is modeled by a mathematical object called the Hamiltonian, uh, if you let kind of this evolution of a quantum system run for a certain time, uh, then you get to a different state uh, and kind of this time you let it run, that's what I would call kind of background time or, or but it's something that's local, in, at least in quantum mechanics. And then a lot of yeah, problems are or like not so much with special relativity, of, but as soon as you combine it with, with uh, general relativity, then problems arise. So in terms of quantum states that you just mentioned, mm -hmm. is it kind of a simultaneous state, which, is, which you're considering a quantum state? Uh, no, a quantum state is, in this sense, I just took kind of a mathematical object. Uh, it kind of lives in a, in a complex a Hilbert, like a complex vector space. Uh, instead of kind of a, a real one as classical variables do. And there's kind of a subtle, subtle differences in the description. And you have like, you can do more stuff. And it seems that kind of on a very kind of small scale, actually nature acts this way. Like it shows phenomena as such as entanglement. And uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you for saying the word entanglement. Uh, <laughs> Alexander, your, your turn, sir. Thank you. No, no, thank you. I just want to say I, I thank you for joining uh, us today, Paul. Uh, I really appreciate that. You didn't have to do that. So I just want to say that. Uh, and um, Zach, you're on stage. If you have any questions, please feel free. It's open conversation. Okay, I'll keep it in mind. Thank you all. Just take on you for a moment. So Paul, it just the last word that you said is entanglement, right? Mm -hmm. So in terms of quantum entanglement, um, can you explain to us just for the room's purpose? And I know what quantum entanglement means, but can you just, in your own terms, define quantum entanglement and how it relates to time, essentially? I don't know how it relates to time, uh, but I don't like you can like there's different kind of way like there's ways i would just say what it is for me first like it's basically like kind of the possibility of of systems to share an overall global state so it can have for example two parts or two systems and instead of like even like each one being in a well-defined state they can have an overall kind of well-defined state while kind of having individually uh very kind of undefined like not undefined but very kind of like being a, in the most entropic state, which is basically that all out, if you kind of inter interrogate the system, then it will give you uh, each outcome kind of basically randomly with a 50-50 chance. Um, so yes, this for me is, is quantum entanglement or like kind of the basis. And how it relates to time is, uh, it's something that we still don't know. Um, in a sense, there's kind of this, uh, there's like a paper from the 80s, which is, was written by Page and Wouters. So that's two physicists from the US. And they basically showed that kind of, uh, you could kind of uh, use this phenomenon of having an overall well-defined or like kind of uh, definite state uh, to kind of show that you could kind of, if you sit on one side of this, of like two entangled systems, of, of like one of an entangled system and you look onto the other you see an evolution although you have like a static overall state so it's kind of something like a uh, and this was kind of like it was kind of for, forgotten for a long time and it kind of resurfaced or gained popularity in the last years and people did a lot of kind of research in this direction and kind of now use it as a formalism which they call page wooters formalism and uh Yes, but it did not lead, it did lead to a lot of nice technical insights and people generalized these things, but I think so far it was, there's no uh, kind of actual kind of experimental or, or uh, things we can draw from this so far. Yes. Paul, what's the name of the theory called again? Uh, the two guys are Page. Uh-huh. Uh, and the other guy's Wouter. So that's W-O-O. 
T T E R S. Got it. Page Wooters. Okay, now yes, and I will see like there's like it was written in eighty three, and there is like very funny, but like, also a little bit annoying because they basically present this very nice result that works for two parts for two particles, and then they just add a paragraph where they say it's easily generalizable to like arbitrarily many particles, but it's actually a hard problem. Uh, and they also never wrote after this on the same topic, but people actually like thirty years afterwards managed to kind of derive nice results in this direction. Got it. Thank just, you so much. Yes. Yes. Paul, um, so you mentioned that when, can you repeat the part where you said that when you stand and look back, there was a deformation? Can you, can you, can you, can you rephrase, can you uh, repeat that? Okay, so basically the, the basic result of, of Page and Wooters, what they show is that you could kind of uh, like have like an overall static state which basically is kind of a time invariant global state of systems. But if you kind of look on a kind of local and marginal perspective, if you stand on one kind of part of this overall uh, static state and you look onto the other one, then you actually see something like change or evolution. Okay. So Paul, wow. Thanks for saying that. Uh, I yeah. think, I, so after speaking to you today, I have to say I'm even more confident in, in, uh, my formalization of intelligence um i've been working on this for quite some time and um everything you've said today has been in line with what uh i've sort of come to learn and um my formalization is very simple it's actually symbolic uh and because my formalization is so abstract and symbolic it actually gives me the ability to um 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 to derive um um essentially all other an infinite amount of models uh from this one abstraction which which i think is sort of the foundation of of um of of, of intelligence uh and that time is actually an emergent phenomena uh, and, and 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 since it's discrete and it's emergent um what are the rules that governs the emergence of time the interaction of time and the evolution of time, and when you said that, when you stand on one of those variables and you look back at the other at the other two variables, you see an evolution, you see a change. You know, when I, when I stand on if if you if you if you envision a triangle, an infinity and a circle, and imagine that these are three dimensional objects, and then imagine that you're standing within the circle like a Vitruvian man, like Da Vinci drew the Vitruvian man. And now imagine that behind the circle is the infinity and beyond that is a triangle. So when you stand at that door as the Vitrivian man, what you're seeing is the evolution of time all the way to the end until it converts into a triangle. So when you were speaking, that's how I visualize it. And it's all in line with the symbolic representation that I that I formalized, um, uh, that it's uh, pinned up on the, um, in the room up here. So thanks for joining us today, Paul. Really appreciate okay. it. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll try to have a look. I'll, 